Hello, welcome to World Civilizations Since 1500. Now, this is session three of the fifth topic of the semester titled European Colonialism Old and New. Now, in this session, we're going to continue looking at the new colonialism or late colonialism um, centered on the formation of industrial empires. Again, in the previous session, we were looking at the old colonialism centered on plantation empires, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. But uh, as I explained, around the 1700s with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, Europe is now in need of certain raw materials to develop their industrial economies. And they're also in need of markets as well for you know, where to sell their industrial products as well. So they're going to be moving into different areas of the globe and trying to seize control of territories that were valuable in terms of providing uh, the minerals, for example, uh, to fuel their industries, iron ore, for example, copper, um, uh, coal, uh, lumber, rubber, and also the agricultural products, you know, particularly palm oil, um, cotton, and the like, uh, to develop their industries. Um, and as we'll see, they're also going to be in great need of pursuing markets, you know, where to actually be selling their industrial goods as well. So this is going to push the Europeans into different areas of the globe to come in and try to seize more and more control of those areas in order to extract the resources while at the same time use the colonial populations as consumers for their manufactured goods. You know, we were paying attention in the last session to the British, for example, starting this process in India, uh, forming a colony there and pretty much taking control by uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s. Again, India is formally now part of the British Empire. Um, we were also looking at um, the Dutch, for example, moving into uh, Southeast Asia, uh, we were also looking at Africa as well, uh, the partition of Africa, how the uh, European powers in 1885 are going to uh, draw the map of Africa and pretty much divide it into a series of colonial territories given to different European powers for them to, once again, extract natural resources from those regions. Uh, we were looking in this process at the French, for example, moving into Northwest Africa and pretty much establishing a series of uh, colonial domains there. We were looking at their uh, colonial territories and the like. And what we're going to be doing here is uh, proceeding with this discussion um, by looking now at the British colonization of Africa, how they're going to just like the French, seize certain territories, build a series of colonies for the purpose of fueling their industries as well. And yet Africa, more than any other territory of the globe, provided all that Europe required for their successful industrialization. Uh, if you uh, listen to session two, we were looking at, for example, the uh, independence revolutions in the American continent that spread from 1776 all the way to the early part of the uh, 1800s and Europe pretty much lost control of America. So again, they had to turn their attention to other areas of the globe in order to obtain their needed resources and Africa was precisely that area. So this is going to be central. Africa will play a critical, critical role uh, in the uh, ascendancy of Europe to the world stage, uh, mainly providing valuable materials. So the British are also building a series of colonies, as you can see in this map, um, colonies that encompass, for example, from the northeastern section of Africa, starting from Egypt and moving all the way down in a line uh, from Egypt, the Sudan, for example, Kenya, 
Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and uh, the Rhodesias as well, moving all the way to uh, South Africa. So as you can see in this map, uh, all of this territory fell under the hands of the British Empire uh, starting around 1885 onwards. Again, they, they are really building a very vast territorial empire in Africa. And one of the critical figures uh, in this process of colonization was Cecil Rhodes. Again, Cecil Rhodes was really the architect of the British Empire in Africa. He was the one that actually um, moved into Africa and was able to uh, build a series of colonial domains uh, for the British. And, you know, his grand dream, as he put it, was to build an empire from Cairo, that is, again, from northern Egypt, all the way to South Africa, and it materialized, by the way. Again, so this is something that he constructed, uh, of course, not by himself, but he was really the, one of the main uh, agents, if you will, uh, in Africa for the British Empire in this, in this project. Um, again, he pretty much embodied, really, uh, the mentality of the time in Britain in terms of uh, now with the uh, added benefits of the Industrial Revolution, uh, particularly the new weaponry, for example, you know, the iron and steel industry uh, and the factories, of course, uh, the British were now building an empire that really encompass many regions of the globe, really building a global empire. Uh, and Cecil Rhodes was part of this process, again, uh, centered particularly in Africa. Um, himself, Rhodes, uh, will be critical in the formation of mining industries. Uh, that became central to uh, the British economy, particularly Industries related to the diamond, for example, industry, you know, diamond mining. Those were diamonds extracted out of Africa. He built uh, a very large company, almost a monopoly, uh, was called the Beers Company. And this uh, company uh, was able to uh, build a very prominent industry around the world through the practice of not only mining the diamonds in Africa, but withholding the, uh, the diamonds uh, from the market in order to create scarcity, uh, an artificial scarcity, and pretty much driving the price up. Uh, again, that really just inflated the price uh, many, many fold to the point that, for example, a single diamond that would have cost $30 will be sold in the market for $3,000, for example, you know, just to give you an idea. So it was uh, at the same time that he was building uh, the uh, empire in Africa, he was at the same time building uh, a monopoly, if you will, of, uh, of diamond production. Now, in terms of how the British governed their colonial possessions in Africa, it will be something quite different from the way the French were building their imperial systems uh, in northwestern Africa. You know, if you recall in session two, we were talking about how the French were ruling their colonies directly. And they will appoint the governor, and the governor received direct orders from Paris, the capital of the empire. So it was a very top-down, very structured system, and the French from Paris were ruling their own colonial possessions overseas. Here, the British opted to follow a quite different path, uh, a more sort of a indirect rule in which, indeed, they will appoint a royal governor uh, to lead each colony, but that royal, col uh, that royal governor 
uh, will administer the colony not necessarily by following orders from London, which in many cases they had to, of course, follow those policies, but more often than not, uh, there was a certain shared governance with the settlers, with the colonists as well, you know, the British residents. Uh, the British residents were granted uh, some local authority or autonomy to form their uh, local assemblies or uh, councils, for example, governing councils, something similar to the way they govern, for example, the 13 colonies of North America. You know, they followed kind of a similar pattern of governance. Uh, and the 13 colonies uh, were uh, governed of course, through royal governors, but at the same time, each colony had a kind of colonial assembly, you know, in which the residents uh, of each colony were granted the right to exercise also uh, of a certain degree of authority as well. So this is the kind of system that we're seeing here in Africa that the British implemented. Um, so, again, it's quite different from the French model. Now, in terms of politics, of course, this seems a little bit, you know, kind of, uh, quote-unquote, democratic to a certain degree. It was not total that democracy was not. But there was a shared governance. But when it comes to the economy, now, the British pretty much established a, a more rigid system to govern their colonies. Because, once again, you know, uh, the purpose of building this empire uh, was to extract the raw materials and natural resources to develop their industrial systems, their industrial economies. So the economy had to be managed in that fashion, in a very colonial way, so to speak. You know, the colonies needed to serve the mother country in that regard. So... The British, just like the French and, of course, the Germans and others that are moving into Africa, are going to set up similar, not really necessarily identical systems, but they will make sure that they will extract the maximum amount of wealth out of Africa. And, of course, um, the British, in this case, in their own colonial possessions, introduced, for example systems of what's called coercive labor uh, you know for the extraction of minerals for example uh, iron ore and coal and copper and the like out of africa and of course they are also developing a series of plantations in order to grow palm oil and cotton and the like as well and they required labor and they're going to use the indigenous population for that purpose. So the colonial population, of course, has no interest in participating in those industries. You know, they are indeed quite independent. Uh, they have their own farms, they're all growing their own grains. Some people uh, are attending their, uh, not only their crops as well, but also their animals, their herding animals, for example, or their tending animals, grazing them, and the like. And so they're kind of leading a, an autonomous existence in Africa, conducting their own economic activities. So they're not going to feel that anxious in participating, again, in mine, mining work or in you know plantation systems. So one way to push that population into those enterprises that the British are introducing is by, for example, coercing them to participate in them by, for example, introducing a general tax, which they called a head tax. Okay. Again, this is a tax that has to be paid to the British, not because they are engaging in a commercial transaction, not because they're buying something. For example, there's, this is not really a sales tax. Again, uh, but rather, this is a tax that must be paid just by virtue of being African, for example. So if you are a native African, you must pay the so-called head tax uh, to the British. And this 
head tax has to be paid specifically in British currency. So this is not the kind of tribute, for example, that other empires require from populations in terms of just pr providing, for example, you know, uh, a certain amount of agricultural products or animals or wood, etc. But rather, this is a head tax that has to be paid with money, British currency, in other words. So the British are going to introduce British currency into their own colonies, which was really non-existent in the past. Again, those uh, regions, those societies, were not functioning under a so-called monetary system. You know, people barter, people traded goods, uh, or they were self-sufficient. They were just producing their own food, for example. Okay, um, so why is the British doing this? Is because well, this is the only way that you can coerce people to work for you in the mines and in the plantations because. If people don't have money, but they have to pay the head tax, well, they have to get the money to pay the head tax. And the way to do it is to work for the British. So you will have to work in a mine or in a plantation in order to be paid a wage with the British currency. And in turn, that money will have to be used to pay the head tax, in other words. So again, this was a very clever way to start pushing people into those enterprises. And of course, it was not only moving people into those enterprises, this is a coercive method, by the way, but it was also a way to get the people off their own lands as well. Again, yeah, because you know, people need to pay their head tax. So again, each family will have to send members of their families to work in the mines or plantations to earn that money. And so that was a way to start driving people away from their own farms and their own domains as well. The other measure, again, it's a coercive measure, you know, was the introduction of what was called a labor gang. Uh, this is something that uh, previously it was known back in Europe, for example, under feudalism as the corvée, for example, the corvée. It was a labor tribute. Okay, you need to pay tribute, in other words, to the British, in this case, by working a certain amount of time. It can be a few days out of the week, again, uh, and to participate, again, in those enterprises, you know, mining and agricultural work. Um, so what the British were doing is that they were moving into the interior of their colonies uh, and they were requesting, requiring, in fact, or demanding that certain amount of males, in this case, had to go to work for the British several days out of the week, for example, again. So from each village, from each community, had to provide that kind of tribute, send their males from a certain age to work for the British again in those enterprises as well. So again, that was another kind of measure that they implemented. Okay. Now, another European power that participated in the colonization of Africa was Belgium. And Belgium, in this case, sees certain regions of Africa, particularly what was formerly known as the Congo, uh, the Kingdom of the Congo, pretty much disintegrated uh, by the 1600s, and it totally collapsed. And in, in its place, what we're going to see is that as we're moving into the 19th century, Belgium, in particular, particular, sees this territory that was kind of up for grabs, so to speak. Uh, the political structure that rule over the Congo pretty much disintegrated in the past. So again, it had really no real leadership uh, that will claim the territory for itself. Now, the difference between the French, British, and the Belgian colonies is that the Belgian Congo, as it was known, 
was owned by the king. So this is a proprietor colony. You know, the King Leopold II was the owner of this colony. Okay, so the Belgium state is not going to be governing the colony, but rather it was just the king himself. He was the owner of, of, this, of this new colonial possession. As you can see here in this map, and the individual that helped King Leopold II acquire this colony was an individual, pretty much uh, a journalist, so to speak, that turned into a sort of real estate agent. His name was Henry Stanley. Okay, uh, Henry Stanley uh, moved into Africa in the 1880s very well-renowned journalist published articles that were read in Europe and or North America as well. And while he was in Africa, he became a kind of adventure, pioneer, explorer. And during his explorations, he became a personal agent of the King of Belgium. And he was instrumental, like a power broker, so to speak, in uh, acquiring a series of territories that together encompassed uh, the colony of Congo that became the sole possession of the King, King of Belgium. Okay, Now, this colony was ruled by the king himself, but there's something quite unique that occurred in this process in that what the king de did was to award certain concessions to a series of private private trading companies to move into Congo and to rule the colony on his behalf. So this is not really a political structure or political body. Uh, that is going to rule uh, the colony, but rather those are just trading companies that have been given certain licenses and permits by the king. In other words, they have received a charter from the king to operate within the Congo, and they are the ones that are going to be pretty much conducting both business, in other words, the extraction of natural resources and at the same time trying to control the labor force as well. So they are indeed being given license to extract things like ivory, for example, rubber, copper, and they build a series of railroads, of course, that connected to the coastline. And we can just go back, you know, a moment here so you can see how those companies build railroads within Congo, but the idea is that the railroads were serving the purpose of transferring the materials from the interior of Africa to the coastline, and from the coastline, of course, to be shipped back to Belgium. Okay, so that was the idea again. So this is a colony ruled by a handful of corporations. And as such, because this is not really a colonial government per se, this is just again, you know, a series of companies uh, that established a series of company towns, so to speak, and they are indeed uh, very, very interested in maximizing output, you know, that's trying to export as much as possible, trying to mine as much as possible the minerals and the like out of the Congo, they're going to engage in unrestrained behavior. Let it just put it that way. Okay. And they're not being supervised. You know, we don't have a governor that is sending reports, you know, back to Belgium or back to the king, pretty much informing of the situation. So the companies are pretty much unrestrained. And they're going to engage in uh, very, let us just say, unethical behavior. Uh, in terms of pushing the native inhabitants of this region 
to the extreme in terms of demanding, for example, tribute from them in terms of labor, you know, very exhaustive and coercive as well. And uh, according to certain, of course, uh, reports and even novels that were written during this time, for example, a novel written by Joseph Conrad, who was famous for his uh, epic novel about Africa, you know, called The Heart of Darkness. This epic novel, The Heart of Darkness, really talks about the Congo and the extreme economic exploitation that was taking place by those private corporations, in other words. Uh, and in it, he really revealed, you know, the kind of excessive use of force to exploit the population. And in this process, uh, the kind of brutality, in other words, of imperialism and colonialism as well. In other words, that this is really, again, exhibiting perhaps a very dark phase of uh, imperialism, uh, 19th century imperialism in Africa, in which the natives were, you know, treated, you know, pretty much with total disregard and disregard to their health, disregard to their well-being, to their lives and to their, you know, cultures and families and the like because of the uh, obsessive and compulsive uh, behavior of those merchants uh, ruling the region and pretty much giving free reign to their greed, again, to pretty much trying to exploit uh, both the population and the natural resources to the maximum. Again, this is called the heart of darkness. So it was a really uh, kind of like a like legendary kind of um, tale of the height of European imperialism and how in certain situations, uh, when it becomes totally unrestrained, it can lead, of course, to barbarism as well. So uh, while the Europeans, of course, advertised the idea that they were there to develop their, you know, the native or indigenous societies and cultures, they were trying to uplift those cultures uh, from bar backwardness, for example. And that was the idea that, you know, the European culture and civilization was true civilization and that were they were there to share the benefits of modernity and were trying to modernize them but you know in fact in situations such as in Congo of course uh, the opposite was true okay so that's what the heart of darkness was conveying uh, in uh, in that story all right so now we're turning to the Middle East uh, the Europeans were also be moving into areas of the Middle East uh, as we're moving into the uh, 19th century as well. And uh, it is very significant, very important to note that up to this time, still, uh, a great portions of the Middle East was under the control of an Islamic empire. Uh, we talked about them in the past, and those are the Ottomans, you know, the Ottoman Empire. Okay, they control most of the Middle East, uh, with the exception of Persia, of what today is Iran, for example. Okay, that's the only exception. Now, as you can see in this map, uh, the Ottoman Empire that was really formed back in the 1300s was able to expand not only within the Middle East, in parts of the Arabian Peninsula, parts of Mesopotamia as well, but also into the Eastern Mediterranean, as you can see, part of Southeastern Europe and also North Africa. You know, they build a vast, vast empire. We talked about that in the past. When we talk about, for example, the trading empires, you know, it is in that discussion. So this empire, however, despite the fact that it was quite successful in expanding and establishing a quite stable imperial system and administration, as we're moving into the 17 and 1800s, it was becoming more and more evident that this empire was entering its gradual decline. 
Okay. There are several reasons why the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire began to decline gradually. And this is going to provide an opening, so to speak, for the Europeans to start coming in and pretty much seizing control of certain territories and certain natural resources as well and clipping off certain colonial provinces of the Ottoman Empire as well, as we'll see in this discussion. So what were the reasons, what were the factors that led to the gradual decline of the Ottoman Empire? Now, there will be about four major factors that I want to discuss here. The first factor was the fact that the Europeans, if you recall in earlier discussions, when they were confronted with the rise of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, and the Ottoman Empire pretty much created a roadblock, you know, pretty much the Ottomans were trying to monopolize the spice trade, and they prevented the Europeans from participating in it, the Europeans in the 1400s began to develop an alternative trade route, an alternative network. You know, we cover that in the past as well, starting with the Portuguese, trying to find a trade route around Africa to move into the Indian Ocean. And they succeeded at that as well, okay, the Portuguese. So what we see is that as the Europeans are trying to reach the Asian markets, they're going to develop their own trading network around Africa into the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. And they're going to bypass the Ottoman roadblock altogether. Okay, so the Ottomans will be losing significant trade uh, with Europe as a result of that. Again, so that's really the very first, as you can see in this map, you know, those are the networks that we talked about in the past. Number two has to do with also a decline in the Ottoman imperial administration. It was becoming more and more disorganized and sloppy. For example, the Janissaries, this is the military corp that were the personal army of the Ottoman Sultan, the emperor, in other words, those were individuals that were trained for life. They had to devote their entire existence to serve the emperor and fight in the battlefield. They had to be uh, single. They were prohibited from being married and so on. Again, devoted their entire life to military service and the like. Very disciplined. You know, by the 1700s, this tradition began to change significantly. The Janissaries are now engaging in trade, they're getting married, and they're not really t totally committed to devote their entire existence to serving the Sultan anymore. So again, this is part of that, you know, decline uh, in the imperial administration. And also, again, that the Ottomans themselves, as imperial administrators, we're also becoming quite sloppy and incompetent as well. Again, pretty much, you know, very disorganized. And they're not going to uh, provide cohesion to the empire, trying to consolidate it the way they tried to consolidate the empire in earlier centuries. And they're pretty much becoming far more relaxed and overconfident in, in so many regards. Part of this overconfidence has to do with... Uh, building new kinds of relationships with the Europeans that are now knocking on their doors. Uh, and there will be, of course, significant exchange now with the Europeans. But remember, you know, as we'll see, uh, the Europeans, their intentions, of course, is to expand not only trade, uh, but also uh, their industrializing. So they're going to be pursuing also natural resources. So we see the rise of Europe with the new technologies, with the Industrial Revolution and the like. Because we see a stronger Europe, the Ottomans will cease to expand territorially 
I mean, this is a trend that really spanned for many, many centuries, the Ottoman expansion. There will always be new provinces to expand into, to collect tribute, to enrich the coffers of the sultan and the like. You know, that was the idea, you know, territorial expansion. But now the Ottomans feel constricted. They can no longer expand. They feel constricted because there's a more powerful Europe, so to speak, that prevents them from, from expansion. Okay. Um, and so, again, they're going to be denied, of course, access to resources, to tribute, monies, and the like. Because, again, this is what actually feeds an empire, you know, territorial expansion. So, we can say that the Ottoman, expand, the Ottoman Empire is now contracting, so to speak. Okay. The French are now knocking at their doors... And there are French merchants, for example, that want to participate in trade with the Ottomans. And we're going to see waves and waves of French companies, merchants, and the like arriving to the Ottoman lands. You know, those are the incursions, so to speak. And the Ottomans welcome the French, in other words, you know, they see the the French as investors, you know, as trading partners. So more trade, the better for them, you know. So this is how they see the situation. Now, uh, according to Ottoman tradition, if you recall, this is a very diverse empire. It really com is comp comprised of a multiplicity of different ethnic groups, linguistic groups, cultural groups, religious groups, etc. Quite diverse. Even though uh, the administrators all the way to the sultans, are, they're all Islamic. I mean, they're not really imposing the Muslim faith on everybody. They follow uh, a policy of granting local rule. This is what's called the Millet system. The Millet system, again, is really granting each religious group or ethnic group uh, a certain kind of local autonomy, meaning that, look, you know, whether we're talking about Christians or Muslims or Jews, for example, among others, or Greek Orthodox, for, for instance, they were granted the right to conduct their own affairs, to conduct their own ceremonies, their festivals, their rituals, and the like. They even were granted the right to choose a leader among themselves to be the representative of their own community. You know, the only thing they have to do is pay tribute, of course, to the Sultan. You know, this is what everybody had to do at the end of the day. It was called the Millet system. And so this kind of system was applied to the French as well. So when the French arrived, they also claimed uh, the right to govern their own communities to establish, for example, a community and to be self-governed. Uh, this is what is called extraterritoriality. In other words, look, we're going to install ourselves in your territory, but we're not going to abide by your norms and rules, etc. You know, we're going to be self-rule, self-governed. Yeah. So again, the French are, to a certain degree, taking advantage of that kind of policy called the Millet system, and this is going to be detrimental in the end for the Ottomans, again, because ultimately the French will be gaining more and more uh, entitlements and they're going to increase their territorial um, domains within the Ottoman Empire. By 1536, uh, the Ottomans signed a treaty with the French. Uh, this is called the Capitulation Treaty of 1536. Pretty much... Uh, allowing the French to build a series of colonies within the Ottoman Empire. You know, so this is a kind of gradual, uh, very slow process of colonization that is taking place by 1536. I think this is quite early. Okay. Uh, this is going to destabilize eventually the... Um, the Ottoman Empire to the point that other European uh, groups that were under 
the Ottoman rule, for example, Hungary, it was the kingdom of Hungary that was colonized, you know, back in the 1400s by the Ottomans. They, in 1718, fought for their independence. They feel that the Ottomans were growing weaker and weaker. And now in Hungary, we see massive armies challenging the Sultan and, of course, defeating the Imperial Army, the Janissaries, you know, that we talked about that are quite sloppy and disorganized. And now we see certain areas of Europe that were previously under Ottoman rule. They're breaking apart now gradually. So this is the gradual disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. Okay. Now, with the arrival of the French into Ottoman lands, later on, we're going to see the arrival of the British, as we'll see, as they're going to be moving into certain areas of the Ottoman world, like Egypt, for example. The Ottoman Empire, despite the fact that it was considered an empire, it was now changing, you know, in that... Uh, even though they're still quite, you know, powerful, they are independent and sovereign, their economy is becoming more and more like a colony, a, col a colonial-like economy, in that what the empire provides to the Europeans is raw materials. The French later on the British are extracting massive quantities of raw materials from the Ottoman lands and they're manufactured, of course, they're turning to finished goods in industrial plants in France or in Great Britain. And in turn, what the French and the British do is that they turn around and now import manufactured goods into the Ottoman Empire. Again, this is what a colony does. It, you know, a colony is actually providing natural resources or raw materials to an imperial uh, entity. It can be a mother country or otherwise. And it has no local industries. So it must import manufactured goods from those imperial entities as well. Okay. And so this is going to kind of undermine the local producers within the Ottoman Empire, like the artisans and the craftsmen that used to be the manufacturers, for example. You know, whenever people needed clothing, for example, or iron tools, hardware, etc., you name it. Again, there will be blacksmiths and artisans that will be crafting all of that for the Ottomans. But now they are importing all of those products from Europe. Again, so this is really undermining their colonial economy. In particular, uh, the French and the British will be moving into one region of the Ottoman Empire, and that is a region of Africa. So despite the fact that we talked about the British colonizing regions of Africa that stretch from Cairo, Egypt, all the way to South Africa, I wanted to reserve the discussion of Egypt for uh, the European colonization of the Middle East, because despite the fact that Egypt uh, is in Africa, it kind of culturally speaking, you know, it was part of the Middle Eastern world. It was part of the Ottoman Empire, okay, that controlled the Middle East, okay? It was an Ottoman province that had been governed for many, many centuries. And in the late 18th century, well, 1798, we see that the French, who had been building relationships with the Ottomans, invaded the Ottoman Empire. Particularly, they invaded Egypt. They're one of the most important provinces uh, of that empire. And it was invaded by Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, who was later crowned emperor of France uh, during the period of uh, the tumultuous French Revolution. When, while he was a general, he, in, during his adventures and exploits as a French general, he moved into the Ottoman Empire and pretty much invaded and occupied Egypt for a time. Okay, so uh, what that revealed was 
the weakness of the Ottoman Empire to fend off uh, the European incursions, you know, in this case, the French incursions, okay, that had been going on in the past by merchants, but now we're seeing more and more military incursions, okay, during this time. It revealed, of course, the weakness of the Ottoman Empire, but also it revealed uh, the weakness of Egypt as well. You know, this is leading, of course, to the need to change and update, upgrade, or what is called modernize, you know, uh, non-European societies. You know, so this is how non-Western societies who are exposed to the technologies of the West or Europe are feeling during the you know during this time, particularly as we're moving into the 19th century, they feel that they must catch up, in other words, with the changes taking place in Europe. They must modernize, in other words. Okay? And this is going to lead to a series of changes within Egypt itself. For example, uh, we see that well, Egypt was governed, of course, by colonial governors like Mehmet Ali, for example, who governed Egypt from 1803 to 1846. They are going to embark upon a project of modernization, trying to rebuild their societies, trying to revamp their economies, so they will become more efficient, more productive to create, of course, wealth. So they're going to turn to the Europeans, something we mentioned in session two, for aid, for assistance. Again, so this is what, again, the uh, leaders of Egypt will be doing. They're going to be turning to the Europeans for help, for aid, for financial assistance, and trying to borrow their knowledge, technologies, and you know, trying to borrow capital as well in order to transform their, their societies. And what Mehmed Ali, for example, uh, tried to do was to modernize the military because it was again, proved to be quite inefficient, fending off Napoleon, you know, uh, when Napoleon invaded. So again, he's really trying to create a new army and he's inviting, of course, uh, the French uh, and there are uh, French generals that become kind of advisors uh, and they are the ones, you know, training and trying to pretty much form a totally new military corps uh, in Egypt. And so the Egyptian army is going to be led, again, by, by foreigners in this case. They're also trying to modernize their economies, you know, trying to uh, turn the economy to be more productive, to generate capital. <coughs> One way they're doing this is by uh, borrowing the ideas of Europe in terms of uh, commercializing their agricultural sector. In other words, instead of having just peasants growing crops to sustain their families, their communities, they want to turn that land to the market. They want to grow cash crops, for example. In this case, there's a growing demand for cotton uh, in Europe to fuel the industries, particularly of Britain. And what we see is the commercialization of agriculture in Egypt. You know, the, the massive construction of cotton plantations, particularly uh, cotton plantations in, in Egypt. Okay, so once again, there, there is this kind of change taking place. The Egyptians are trying to imitate uh, the West and they're trying to follow that model. They're trying to modernize again and trying to pretty much move into what is called capitalism, in other words. Okay, his one of his successor, Ismail Pasha, who ruled Egypt from 1863 to 1879, continued with this project of modernization, which eventually led to the formal colonization of Egypt, you know, by Britain. Initially, the main 
providers of aid and assistance were both the, the French and the British. And here, uh, Ismail Pasha wants to modernize Egypt, build new roads, particularly modernize the ports, uh, bring in, of course, telecommunication systems, railroads, and the like, and he's borrowing heavily from French and British financiers. And so there's an influx of capital, of course, into Egypt as they're trying to create, again, a modern infrastructure to accelerate commerce and trade. So they're borrowing heavily. And part of this has to do with a plan to build a canal. Uh, this is the famous Suez Canal. They're trying to build a canal to provide a passage for Europeans to engage in this transcontinental trade that instead of circumnavigating Africa the way it had been done in the past, you know, as I just explained, this alternative you know, network that the Portuguese built initially, and it was used by all Europeans, that instead of doing that, they wanted a shortcut to build a canal so the Europeans will just use the Mediterranean Ocean, go across the Suez Canal into the Red Sea, and from there reach, of course, India. And so, of course, you know, both the French and the British were very, very interested in this. And initially, the French companies started building the canal. They were the ones actually engaged in this process. Eventually, they ran out of resources, and the British are going to pick up the bill, in other words. They're going to complete it. In this process, of course, uh, Egypt is acquiring a massive internal debt. You know, they're actually borrowing money in order to carry out all those projects. But eventually, as we'll see, they're going to be uh, totally uh, unable to pay back the loans. And again, this is going to lead to the destabilization of uh, Egyptian society, eventually leading to the total colonization of Egypt, particularly by Great Britain. Okay? Uh, so they are indeed providing the loans for internal developments, but as the Egyptians are unable to pay back the loans, of course, that internal development, whether we're talking about railroads, we're talking about ports, we're talking about roads or the Suez Canal, uh, will be falling into foreign hands eventually. Again, so this is leading to this destabilization of Egyptian society. This is leading to the Western, of course, domination uh, of Egypt. Uh, this has to do, of course, with the loss of peasant lands. About 40% of the lands that were owned by peasants in Egypt are now owned by uh, large landowners, many of whom are uh, foreigners. Again, whether they're French, British, there will be some Egyptians as well. But this is leading to the massive privatization, again, of peasant lands. We also see, of course, the introduction of Western ideas into this Islamic society, you know, secularism, this idea of trying to separate church and state, for example, uh, trying to get, for example, a secular education in which people will be trained um, in, the, in modern science, for example, mathematics, physics, and, and separate, of course, religious uh, education from scientific education as well. So this was contrary to the values, of course, of uh, Egyptian society because, again, they had been governed by uh, an Islamic uh, uh, elite that pushed for religious education, for example, and really religious values in general. Okay, So this is, again, leading to sort of cultural uh, clashes. Okay, uh, We have, of course... The idea that the top bureaucratic leadership in Egypt were also foreigners, okay, uh, even members of the Egyptian administration or British, for example, uh, within the Egyptian army, we also find that the main generals, the top brass, so to speak, were also foreigners as well, leading, of course, the Egyptian soldiers as well. And Last but not least, uh, because of this 
increasing foreign debt uh, that the Egyptians are building up in order to develop their economies and modernize it, they ended up, of course, with a massive debt that was, from their perspective, impossible to pay back. You know, those unpaid loans eventually by 1883 pushed the British to gain now direct control of Egypt. So again, from 1883 onwards, Egypt becomes now part of the British Empire, okay, in, uh, formally, okay. So this is in terms of the Middle East. Now let's look at China. This is going to be the last region we're going to look at, you know, how the Europeans will be moving into China proper. So, to understand the Europeans moving into China, now we're not going to see the kind of uh, direct colonial control that we saw, for example, in Egypt or Africa, you know, here in China. It's not going to be like, like that. It would be more of an economic influence or dominance, not political. But to understand that, we have to go back to China relationships with Europeans, and those kinds of relationships goes go back in time, many, many centuries into the past. It goes back to the beginning of, you know, the Silk Road, so to speak. You know, during the Han Dynasty, we talked about, you know, when they were exporting silks uh, along the Silk Road, for example. I know those relationships were not really so direct, so to speak. They intensified with the commercial revolution of the 14th century, by the way, as you know, the Europeans were now consuming massive quantities of silks. And China, the rise of China to the world stage as one of the perhaps the largest economies, as I explained, in the world, had to do with the fact that they build an economy based on exports. They were an export-led economy, you know. They had following this pattern for many, many centuries of you know uh, producing massive quantities of exotic goods like silks, tea, porcelains, and exporting it to different areas of the world, trying to limit also their imports as well. And that's part of the Chinese formula that led to their rise. Now, in the 1400s, uh, China, as a result of, for example, the increasing trade with the West, China, as we're moving into the 1400s, began to create the very first monetary system centered on silver, based on silver, the silver standard, something that cons was consolidated in the 15 and 1600s with the discovery of the new world and the massive extraction of Mexican silver. You know, how the Europeans were mining silver, for example, the Spanish mining silver, for example, in Mexico, and this silver flooded the European system. It becomes money in Europe. It led, led to inflation, as I explained as well. But because Europe was a major client of Chinese merchants, you know, Europe was a major consumer of silks and teas and porcelains, of course, most of this Mexican silver was flowing into China as well. It was part of the success story of China. Again, that they had, of course, major European consumers or clients, and they were exporting those products to Europe. And in return, all this silver was flowing in into China. Okay, so again, this is leading to the ascendancy of China. Now, China was very, very uh, careful to deal with the Europeans, you know, uh, even up to the uh, 1700s, the Europeans were only awarded a certain region, you know, the port of Canton, for example, to anchor their ships there and to bring in limited goods, but mostly, again, to actually, you know, buy Chinese products. Again, in, in only one season out of the year. So one season. Again, it was a very, very limited region of China that the Europeans could, could enter and only in certain moments of the year as well. And that was the port of Canton, 
that was the very first foothold that Europe had within China itself. Again, China was very, very cautious of not allowing the Europeans to engage in more and more commercial um, uh, activities within China itself. Now, what the British realized is that there was a certain trade imbalance. In other words, that what they realized is that uh, the British were major consumers of Chinese goods, okay, and the silver that the British paid for those goods was flowing in abundance into China. But China was not really buying anything from Great Britain. They were not interested. Okay? It's it only as if China was just engaged in this massive export of products into Britain and not importing much from Britain itself. So this, again, is leading to a trade imbalance, okay? a very uneven relationship. So the British were trying to find a way how to correct that imbalance. You know, what can we sell to the Chinese so we stop sending so much silver into China itself, for instance? And they realized that, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Chinese have been, of course, using uh, opium for medicinal purposes. Again, this is not something that they consume on a massive scale. Again, the opium had been used particularly by the elite and by certain herbalists and healers, again, for medicinal purposes. So they had a certain inclination towards this uh, drug, this narcotic. And what they realized is that this narcotic was grown uh, in their colony in India, again, in Bengal, for example, in the Bay of Bengal, where the British were already building uh, a colony in India, this was the ripe region for the production of opium. So they decided to grow the opium in Bengal, in India, in order to start importing it on a massive scale into China again. So this is leading now to a new situation that the British are bringing in, the kind of opening the market in China so to speak, in that they are now importing massive quantities of opium. It's a flood of imports in this case, and this is going to lead to the massive consumption of this narco narcotic within China itself. And this is going to also, at the same time, lead to massive, of course, problems of addiction as well. Again, so th this becomes a national problem in China. Again, you know, uh, how... Uh, uh, it is reported that anywhere between 30 to 40 percent uh, of the population were already turning to this narcotic, in other words, okay, with dire consequences, of course. This led, of course, the imperial government of China to deal with the situation, you know, and so, you know, the imperial government commissioned one administrator by the, by the name of Lin, Commissioner Lin, for example, to investigate this matter, and indeed, uh, he realized, uh, Commissioner Lin, that the British were the ones that were bringing in, of course, the opium into China, and it has become, of course, a national problem. Uh, he tried to write a letter to Queen Victoria, the Queen of England, uh, to report, of course, on the situation, to try to restrain, of course, the British, uh, in this case, the British East India Company, that was really the one uh, conducting those activities, um, that was importing the opium, of course, but the letter never got to the Queen Victoria, of course. So again, he decided to take, you know, uh, this issue uh, into his own hands. So he moved in and destroyed massive quantities of opium that were brought in by the British East India Company, 21,000 chests of opium. He dumped them into the sea, reminiscent to what happened in the Boston Tea Party, in 1773 in North America, where the colonists actually destroyed also black tea that was brought in by the East India Company that was really trying to monopolize the tea trade. And that led, of course, to a series of wars uh, between Britain and China, otherwise known as the Opium Wars. The first Opium War spanned from 1839 to 1842. Again, uh, Britain was trying to defend that trade 
In other words, really saying that this was a violation of what they call free trade. And they use, of course, you know, uh, their new technologies like the Nemesis, for example. This is an iron gunboat that was propelled by steam. It was smaller. It could be used to, you know, navigate within rivers within China. And this was the great success story of the British to uh, pretty much subdue the British, uh, the Chinese forces in this case. So the outcomes uh, of the war resulted in the reparations, of course, paying the East India Company $21 million for uh, indemnity, of course, uh, cost and so on. Uh, silver is now flowing out of China while opium was flowing in. And of course, the Treaty of Nanking as well. The Treaty of Nanking, of course, is uh, ceding the port of Hong Kong to Great Britain. So again, they're gaining more and more territories, of course. And also uh, what is called extraterritoriality, you know, the so-called treaty ports, as they're known. In other words, that it was not just Britain, but a series of European powers will be granted access to Chinese markets by giving each European power, of course, a port of their own to exploit as well, as you can see in this map. Later on, there'll be another, of course, war, the second Opium War from 1856 uh, to 1860. In this case, this is a French and uh, British coalition fighting uh, the Chinese that tried to stop the opium trade once again. And that resulted with the final defeat of the imperial forces of China and with the uh, semi-colonization uh, of China. Again, granting European powers, along with Japan, spheres of influence for the Europeans to come in and sell their manufactured goods inside of China, as you can see in this map. So each one of them were granted, of course, a series of uh, territories for them to bring in their manufactured goods, of course. Okay, so this is not really colonization itself. This is more about economic, of course, dominance. We see an influx of European goods and also Christian missionaries. The, you know, the Europeans are also bringing in their Christian missionaries in order to uh, convert the population of China to Christianity. You know, as a part of this process as well. The effects of the industrial empires is that again, Europe is now expanding territorially on a massive scale around the world. You know, by 1914, Europe and her colonies constituted 80% of the world, of the world map. Again, was really in the hands of Europe and uh, controlled through their colonial territories as well. Just Great Britain alone, its empire constituted 25% of the world people, as you can see in this map. Again, this is, again, what the sun never sets. Again, uh, from North America, parts of South America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia. It's, again, it's a vast uh, empire, okay? So there's a massive, of course, uh, uh, empire. This, of course, a displacement of political elites, where we're talking about Africa, India, Southeast Asia. Uh, the local elites are losing control of their own societies, and they're being replaced, of course, by colonial powers, and those economies are becoming more geared towards exports. Those are export economies that export raw materials, minerals, agricultural products. And of course, their local populations are coerced uh, to serve in those mining or agricultural enterprises as well. We said, of course, the rise of course of labor. We see, of course, acculturation and assimilation, Western education, religious conversion, of course, is part of the process of uh, this late colonialism, this idea of progress that, you know, we are indeed, you know, bringing modernity development uh, to the world. That was the idea, you know, capitalist enterprises, of course, wage, labor, individualism, science and technology. Of course, there is this idea that this is not just colonialism for the sake of colonialism, but rather that this is, you know, uh, the uplifting of cultures from around the world, the transformation of world cultures, so they will become more westernized, in other words, based on progress. Again, this is what the Europeans uh, were telling themselves. Of course, this is leading to what is called uh, Eurocentrism, the idea that, look, uh, Europe, of course, is really, you know, uh, the, the center of world power, and uh, the world has to catch up with the West, 
you know, this is some, some of the ideas that, you know, led to this Eurocentrism uh, were coming from science, from the ideas of Darwin, this idea of the survival of the fittest, that the Europeans were the fittest, in other words, the, the most, you know, cunning, the most intelligent, and that they were engaged in, you know, uh, dominating other groups because this was a struggle, you know, that this is the struggle of nature, that the dominant life forms will eventually rise to the top and will eventually dominate, of course, the world. That was the idea, you know, the survival of the fittest uh, of Darwin. Uh, this is also, of course, you know, part of the uh, philosophy of the white men's burden that, you know, the Europeans see themselves, you know, uh, carrying out a very important mission for God, that they are indeed engaged in this massive sacrifice of moving around the world and pretty much trying to uplift other peoples, you know, because they have been given this burden by God, the so-called white men's burden. Again, so what this is really telling us is that this is leading, of course, to this idea that Europe, of course, uh, was superior and other cultures were just quite, you know, uh, inferior as well. Now, part four uh, is going to lead, uh, is going to discuss rather quickly the anti-colonial resistance movements. Well, there will be, of course, significant pushback, in other words, by the colonial societies because they were undergoing political, economic, social disruptions. And of course, they responded to those disruptions in various forms. You know, James Scott, for example, the anthropologist, uh, famous for writing, of course, uh, books about resistance, the theory of resistance, you know, presents the idea that, look, uh, colonized societies or subjugated societies engage in di different forms of resistance, what he calls weapons of the weak. Sometimes they're active forms of resistance like warfare, sometimes passive forms of resistance such as attitude or jokes, for example, or, uh, you know, breaking tools and the like, you know, that will harm, of course, their oppressors. Again, uh, in this resistance, we're also going to see, of course, the role of religion in order to alleviate and soothe traumatic memories, for example, or stress, you know, this idea that, you know, people resort to religion as an inspiration in order to deal and cope with their material deprivations, for example. And religion also promised, of course, them a return to the past, you know, before the arrival of the Europeans as well. So let's start rather quickly by looking at different, you know, moments, just a snapshots again of resistance movements, starting with the Americas, for example. In 1762, we see, for example, uh, a rebellion uh, led by a native uh, Maya, uh, Jacinto Canek who was resisting, of course, Spanish rule and the caste system, you know, the oppression of the Native Americans, of course. And in this, he's going to uh, respond to a series of changes passed by the Spanish Empire, the so-called Spanish Burman reforms passed in the 1700s, in which they privatized, of course, the lands of the peasantry. Okay, they displaced the peasants, they displace the native elites and that pretty much uh, turn the natives into a workforce to be used for the plantations, of course. And one native again, by the name of Jacinto Uc led an insurrection against the Spaniards. He declared himself to be a sort of messiah of sorts, uh, uh, the kind of a return of an ancestral god king. And he talked about uh, the return of a new world free of Spaniards, in other words. And he rallied the masses and led a massive rebellion against Spanish rule, proclaiming in this process the establishment of, of a new Maya kingdom. Again, a ma major uprising, of course, and that led to a carnage, of course, in a province uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula known as Sisteil, and again, this was a failed attempt to drive out the Spaniards, but nonetheless, this was an indication that the Mayas were responding to colonialism by using to, you know, religious ideas to drive out, you know, the uh, the Spanish Empire. 
In North America, almost in the same time, in 1763, we see another rebellion, otherwise known as Poniac Rebellions, it was really a rebellion against the British expansion into the Great Lakes. You know, the British expansion of the Great Lakes was leading to massive loss of lands and the loss of subsistence traditions of farming, fishing, hunting, for example. We see the incursion of Europeans into the region in bringing with them their own cultural ideas, you know, acculturating the natives to the European ways. And this led to a massive reaction, you know, a prophet by the name of Neolin, a Delaware prophet, again, otherwise, you know, known as a religious figure, uh, a prophet, a seer, you know, uh, believed that uh, the master of life, in this case, that there was, of course, an ancestral being who communicated with him, with him, telling him that people needed to come together and fight the Europeans to drive them out because this was going to lead to a new new time, the restoration of their ancestral lands and ways. And this led one of his disciples, Poniac, a war chief, to start rallying the masses again in 1763 to fight the British. In other words, to recover their ancestral lands and traditions. So we can see how, of course, there is, of course, resistance against colonialism, you know, by religious leaders. Now, in Africa, you know, we're also going to see examples of the same process of resistance. For example, uh, a rebellion in West Africa, the Nigerian Rebellion, uh, spanned for about a century from 1804 to 1903, when we see also here uh Religious individuals like Usman de Fodio, for example, in 1804, who was an Islamic scholar uh, under the branch of Islam, otherwise known as the Sunni branch, he's re really, really leading a kind of revival movement that turned militant, of course. Uh, he was very dissatisfied with the local rulers within uh, this region of Nigeria, and he was complaining, of course, about the local rulers, their corruption, the rise of warfare, you know, their paganism, that they were not really Muslim, in other words. And he assembled a group of disciples that became uh, what is called holy warriors. Again, jihadists, for example. Again, and so he's going to lead a series of holy wars against the local rulers. And in that process, he's going to confront not only the local, local rulers, but also the foreign empires like the British as well. Again, so he's really contesting, in this case, you know, very directly the British Empire. He captures a series of cities and provinces in 1808 and builds a caliphate. It's called the Sokoto Caliphate, as you can see here. It's really an Islamic, you know, political a polity, you know, an entity, in other words, governed you know, by Islamic leaders in this case. Again, so this was an act of resistance against British imperialism. And as a result of that, a century later in 1903, the British moved very decisively and dissolved the caliphate. This was known as the sack of the Sokoto Caliphate in 1903. Uh, in the other end of the African continent, in the Sudan, for example, in the 1880s, we see another rebellion called the Sudan Rebellion, and this was led also by certain religious leaders, uh, Sufis in this case, that were also leading a revival as well. Again, this Sufi was called Muhammad Ahmad. He's a self-proclaimed Mahdi, uh, an end times prophet, in other words, who was really talking about, again, the coming of a new world. He saw himself as a prophet leading the people against the Egyptians and the British at the same time. And in 1881, he built an, an Islamic state, a Mahdist Islamic state in 1881. Of course, the Egyptian rulers, Ismail Pasha, Pasha request the British assistance to quell the rebellion, and the British, along with the Egyptians, of course, moved in. And in 1885, they're actually repelled by the forces in Sudan. Again, so this was not really that successful, you know, as it was, you know, uh, in Nigeria. In China, we see another rebellion, the Taiping Rebellion from 1851 to 1864. You know, this had to do with the incursions of the West, you know, the 
commercialization of agriculture, the introduction of opium, for example, as well, the dominance of the merchant class, you know, within China, the displacement of the peasantry, and also the weakening of the Chinese state in the eyes of the people that the imperial, you know, government had become totally weak and under the control of foreigners. So here, among the peasantry will rise up, once again, a religious figure, you know, somebody who claimed to be the brother of Jesus Christ. Hong Xiu Quan was his name. He built a group, a society of God worshippers, promising people the coming of a new world, an egalitarian society, the heavenly kingdom of great peace, in which, again, uh, there will be no rulers, no leaders, no colonial powers. So this was very anti-imperial in the sense that they wanted to con uh, contest the imperial government of China and also the foreign powers. And it led to a massive rebellion that spanned for uh, over uh, a decade and resulted with the death of about 20 million people. Again, the taping rebellion, again, it was really, again, a response to imperialism as well. Okay, so what are the summary points? Again, what we have covered so far in this discussion is the rise of European imperial states. They rose uh, particularly with the discovery of America. The discovery of America really propelled Europe to world stage because of the natural resources, because of the gold, because of the silver particularly. We talked about that. That led to two stages of imperialism, the plantation empires centered on the Western Hemisphere, and later on with the Industrial Revolution, with the rise of the Industrial Empires. The global effects overall, we see the massive territorial expansion of the European states around the world, the displacement of native societies and leaders, as we explain, of course, uh, cultural imperialism, you know, the imposition of cultural ideas on native societies around the world, environmental degradation as well. And also we saw the decline of Islamic states like the Ottoman and the Mughal empires. Again, they were pretty much now in decline. At the end, we were looking at anti-colonial resistance and movements. Again, the use of religion, for example, to resist uh, colonial uh, powers. You know, that warfare in many cases was motivated by prophets, uh, religious figures, self-proclaimed messiahs. Again, that rally the masses, promising a new time in which there will be, of course, no imperialism, no colonialism, again, and no oppression, okay? So this is the end of this discussion. This is all I have for you uh, concerning this topic. When we come back, we're going to look at modernization in Latin America, Russia, and China. When we come back in the next topic, that will be announced when we come back. Thank you.